and um, so welcome once again to St. Mary's on the Highlands and this opportunity to grow in our faith and to um, explore our faith at um, the feet of one of the great scholars here in the United States. Um, there are a couple of things, um, just um, if you're visiting with us this morning, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you in our midst. We hope that you will come back and um, be a part of this congregation. We we gather particularly on Sundays, but throughout the week for fellowship and for study and for service and would love to have you um, be a part of our life. Um, a couple of comments. Um, the, the lectures today are being taped. Um, they will eventually find their way onto um, the World Wide Web. Okay. Um, Dr. Brugman will speak for approximately about 44 to 45 minutes. Pretty, pretty precise, isn't that, isn't that? So. Um, at the end, um, at the conclusion, he will respond to questions. We'll put this mic right here in the middle, and it's a very helpful thing if you will step up to the mic so that um, the recording will be complete, okay? That is an important part of this. And um, then just kind of a, an announcement for the common good. Remember, next Saturday is um, the Gumbo Gala, and that's a fundraising opportunity sponsored by Episcopal Place. So remember what Episcopal Place is attempting to do in the community. They're attempting to offer housing, um, housing for people who um, are aging and housing um, with people whose income is stretched. So just um, think about that and um, that gathering. It takes place at Regions Field. Finally, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague who will offer a prayer and um, introduce our speaker, Ben. Thank you. I had the great joy and privilege of introducing Walter Brueggemann to you all last night, but in case you missed it, I'll give you um, some important bits of information. Walter Brueggemann is one of the best known, well-respected Old Testament scholars alive today. He is the William Marcellus McFeeders Professor Emeritus of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary. And Dr. Brueggemann is the author of countless books, I think over a hundred, numerous articles and essays, and holds degrees from Elmhurst College, Eden Theological Seminary, Union Theological Seminary, and St. Louis University. And Terence Freedom, I think Old Testament um, professor at Luther Seminary puts it well. Brueggemann's work has the rare quality of being both learned and accessible, including sophisticated theological reflection with which scholars must come to terms, yet available to a wide range of Bible readers. That's us. <laughs> and so thank goodness he's here today. And before he comes up here, I'd like to open in prayer. And this is a prayer that Dr. Brueggemann has written um, in his book, Awed to Heaven, Rooted in Earth. And this prayer is titled, We Are Ready to Listen. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Healing, sovereign God, overmatch our resistant ears with your transforming speech. Penetrate our jadedness and fatigue. Touch our yearnings by your words. Through your out loudness, draw us closer to you. We are ready to listen. Amen. Please join me in welcoming Walter Brueggemann to St. Mary's. Well, glad to uh, get to be with you. Uh, Bentley has... Uh, become one of my favorite pen pals. We've been back and forth a lot, and he has hosted me uh, generously. Uh, since I don't know any of you, I thought the safest thing to do would be to talk about a biblical text, so uh, you have that in your hand. Uh, I will uh, give you two pieces of uh, background information on this. Um, the first one is that the prophet Micah uh, is thought to be dated about 715 BCE. We might miss that by a year or two. Doesn't make any difference. And the second thing that it's useful to know is that the way the economy of ancient Israel worked is that the powerful people 
lived in Jerusalem, the priests, the scribes, the royal family, the bankers, the lawyers, the academics, surrounded by peasants uh, who did subsistence farming, and the people in Jerusalem taxed the peasant farmers to cause money to flow to their surplus wealth in the city of Jerusalem. Does that sound fairly contemporary? <laughs> so uh, I think when we read a biblical text, uh, we're always doing two things. One, we're uh, figuring out how to read the text. Uh, how, how does this text really work? And then we're always uh, sort of asking, how could this be the Word of God now? Uh, which is where you get into trouble. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to uh, read this text with you. About it, or whatever the uh, the the uh, biblical tradition puts this poem in the mouth of Micah, who was. Oh, I should tell you, uh, he came from a little town called Morsheth in Gath, which is about 20 miles southeast of Jerusalem toward the Gaza Strip. So these small peasant farmers had great expectations of Jerusalem, and they also had great resentments toward Jerusalem, kind of the way it works politically for us. Uh, maybe it's in the mouth of Micah, but it could have been free floating through the king's I have a dream speech is now free floating poetry and everybody knows it and you just use it when it's appropriate so maybe that's happened so if you look at this uh, I, I want to spend a little time on uh, how do you read a prophetic text because my secret hope is that one or one or two of you might want to do that sometime on your own <laughs> and what you need to know is that the, the primary artistry of biblical poetry is parallelism, which means you say something and then you say it a second time in different words. And uh, some, uh, very often the second line of the parallelism will be an intensification of the first line. So if you look at this, the, the, the first word is Shema, you know, Shema Israel, the, the main creed of Judaism, hear O Israel, Lord our God is one, so Shema means listen up in Jerusalem. In the next one, abhor justice, and then the parallelism, abhor and the who build Jerusalem, who build who build Zion, who build Jerusalem with blood, and uh, I, I think if you check it, the flood uh, probably means cheap labor. That is, you squeeze more out of poor working people uh, in order to build the word scholars use. He is indicting them uh, for um, bad practice. Then what they do and oracles, and then the third parallelism is bribe, price, money. Range those, you could say, well, on the take uh, thing. The reason. BCE heard that the with money or, or there wouldn't and the urban contemporary mortgage rate and you do it in all the ways that let the power structure I have uh, uh, called 
ask. The first be speaking the truth, they they do church ask of the church. to say God bless of every sentence uh, uh, which means we are, we are all God's privileged people we are all God's chosen people and don't mess with that now if you have a Bible go home open it to this <laughs> and circle the word yet and then the next verse yet uh, in, in German, doch. Nevertheless, in spite of all of that, they go to church and they say, it is so wonderful to be God's chosen people. They say, thank you, Jesus, for blessing us so prosperously. So what the poet, poetry wants to do is to point out the disconnect and the, the deception uh, of the mismatch between economic practice and liturgical pretense. Uh, so uh, probably uh, the last two lines of, uh, of that verse 11 uh, probably are a quote from the Jerusalem liturgy. Uh, you know this sounds for example like uh, Psalm 146, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. And you know uh, that uh, uh, the, the phrase with us uh, in Hebrew, uh, uh, God is with us, is Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God is with us. So it was a, a favorite liturgical tag word in the Jerusalem temple. The Jerusalem temple was, a, was an architectural wonder designed to assure people that God would be with us no matter what. And uh, uh, what the poet is saying is that the, the uh, people who did that assumed that God's presence is unconditional. It doesn't matter what we do, God is with us. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the first task. Then uh, in your Bible, circle the word therefore, and whenever you see the word therefore in the prophets, you want to duck. Uh, uh, so what, what, what the prophets regularly do, they describe what's wrong, then they say what's going to happen, and they connect it with therefore. Uh, so the, the basic argument of, the, of much of the prophetic oracles is that if you if you uh, oppress poor people, therefore, uh, big trouble is going to come. Now, it doesn't really follow logically or scientifically that if you oppress poor people, trouble will come. Important. Most always spoke poetry. They are not making a logical argument because you can do all kinds of things in poetry that you cannot do anywhere else. I'll give you an example. In Hosea 4, this is one of my favorite examples, there's, there's a little poem in which uh, Hosea the prophet says, there is lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery, idolatry, what's that sound like? Ten Commandments. Therefore, he says, therefore, the land mourns, and that's a biblical idiom for drought. And he says the land is drying up so that the birds and the beasts of the field are all going to disappear. So what the, what the argument is, is if you violate the Ten Commandments, therefore you will have a huge environmental crisis and creation will disintegrate. Now, scientifically, it doesn't follow that disobedience to the Ten Commandments will lead to the shriveling up of creation, but you can do all kinds of things in poetry that you cannot do in scientific or logical argument. 
So we got poetry. Therefore, as a result of on the take out as a field because it will be unoccupied. Is economic. Economic. Fully moving poor people out. And Cincinnati, I suppose. Aged in. the sadness that are going to really result in bad things because the world is morally coherent. If, if you go to which follows next, uh, you will see that I left a considerable space there. Uh, and I, I suppose you could say this space uh, is uh, the 50 years of exile after Jerusalem was uh, destroyed. Or you could say, if this is God's word, you could say uh, this space is to allow God to think of what to say next. <laughs> but probably the poem in chapter 4 had nothing to do originally with the poem in chapter 3, but the editorial process put these two texts back to back. And what we do in church, uh, if, if uh, 3, uh, 9 through 12 would come up in church, we would stop reading at the end of the chapter, and then maybe another time uh, we would read beginning with the new poem in chapter 4. So it's very interesting if you look about, if you look about how they've developed a kind of a artificial continuity to connect things. By the time you get to chapter 4, uh, everything has changed. Now the poet is in a wholly different mood. Uh, and if you uh, look at the first phrase, in the days to come, this is a standard uh, poetic cliché. Sometimes it says, uh, in the days to come. Sometimes they say, behold, the days are coming. This is, uh, this is a poetic formula that says, in God's faithfulness, this is going to happen in the future. We don't know when. We don't know how. But it's going to happen. I think that's the rhetoric of I have a dream speech. Uh, when King said that, he had no idea how that would ever happen. He didn't know when, uh, but as he was fond of saying, the arc of history is long, but it is bent toward justice. Uh, so Micah, uh, or whoever put these poems together, wants us to believe that God's fidelity will still work something good. So in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house and if you look back uh, to verse uh, 12, you see the mountain of the house. So that's to connect these poetic fragments. Uh, that means the temple site. Will be established as the highest mountain. And then the parallelism is shall be raised above the hills. So established, raised up, mountains, hills, it's all the same thing. So this is an anticipation that after Jerusalem was destroyed, that's what happened right in this blank space, Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, it's going to be rebuilt, and it's going to be better than ever. This is kind of like uh, the World Trade Center will be higher than ever. But then uh, the poet anticipates that peoples, that's plural, parallelism, many nations, there will be a 
procession of all the peoples of the earth will come to the temple in Jerusalem. This is a, this is a poetic fantasy. And they will all say, come on, come on. Let's all go to the house of the Lord, the parallelism to the house of the God of Jacob. Come on. And the reason to go there is that he may teach that we may walk, that we may get instructed. Because, for, because, out of Zion shall come instruction, and what you need to know is that the word instruction in Hebrew is the word Torah. And then the parallelism, now I don't, I don't know whether this will interest you, but if you look at those two lines, you see that Zion is parallel to Jerusalem, and instruction is parallel to the word of the Lord, but it doesn't say instruction from Jerusalem, word of the Lord, it says, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That poetic reversal is called a chiasmus. It won't hurt you to learn a good technical word. And, and the way you would find this in the commentaries is that Zion is A, instruction is B, the word of the Lord is B, and Jerusalem is A. This is simply a, a rhetorical device to make it a little bit more interesting. So you have A, B, B, A, to reverse the second line. And if you watch that, poets do that kind of thing. Now, this word instruction or Torah, uh, most of the time when that word is used in the Old Testament, it means the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is the classic articulation of the Torah. And if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, what you will see repeated many times is that you have to take care, I said this last night to some of you, you have to take care of widows and orphans and immigrants. You have to take care of vulnerable people who have no resources. So let's all go to Zion and be taught Torah, and then the word of the Lord, because uh, the God who inhabits the Jerusalem temple uh, is going to adjudicate matters. You, you see how this looks back to the first part about economic injustice. When we study the Torah in days to come, we're going to learn how to practice justice toward the vulnerable. And the result of that, this poet anticipates, we won't be greedy anymore, and if we're not greedy anymore, we won't have to go to war anymore. So we will disarm, and you know those lines, we will beat their swords into plowshares, and then you see the parallelism of uh, swords and spears and plowshares and pruning hooks, in which weapons of war will be turned into tools of agriculture. Because the weapons of war never fed anybody tools of agriculture might create enough food even for vulnerable people. So that's what we're going to learn from the Torah, and we're all going to learn it. One of the things that's very interesting about this promise passage is there's no mention of Israel. Jerusalem has now become the meeting place for all the nations to learn how to live together. And the way you learn how to live together is to practice economic justice toward the vulnerable and put your energy into agriculture that will create a food base to feed everybody. You think I'm overreading this text? It could happen. Now, the poem ends in they shall not live. This poem also occurs in Isaiah 2. It's the same poem. So apparently the editors of these two prophetic books said, well, we can use this poem. We'll stick it in here. And we'll stick it in here. But what's interesting about this is that the last part of this that begins, but they shall all sit under their vine and fig tree, is not in the book of Isaiah, in the poem in Isaiah. 
It's only in the poem in Micah. And if you look at what this says, is they shall all sit. Well, well, uh, they've made this plural to avoid masculine gender, but it's really singular. He shall sit under his vine and his fig tree. This is a peasant vision of well-being. One vine, one fig tree, small-time farmer. Isaiah is a city guy, so he doesn't know about one vine and one fig tree, so he wouldn't put that in there. Uh, but what Micah anticipates is that when the economy of greed is terminated, uh, small-time subsistence farmers will be able to grow what they need, and nobody will have to see stuff that belongs to their neighbor. And then, just so you pay attention to this, he adds the last line. This is really God's word for you, even if it's Micah's poetry. So the first task of the prophetic is to describe how things are. The second task of the prophetic is to help people engage in sadness for what must now be lost. And the third prophetic task is to dream newness. So King, in his I Have a Dream speech, was engaged in prophetic discourse. Now, I want to uh, talk about verse 5 because I think it's one of the most extraordinary verses in Scripture. The, the poet has just described all the nations flowing to Jerusalem to be instructed in justice from the Torah, I think, of Deuteronomy. So look at this. All peoples will be in this procession. And I, I, I just wonder how this got in the Bible. And each people will walk in the name of their own God on the road to justice. And we Israelites will walk in the name of Yahweh. Our, we're, not, we're not going to give up our God. We're going to continue to confess our God, but we're going to be on the way with people who serve other gods. That takes my breath away. Well, it means that Christians and Jews and Muslims can all be on the road to neighborly justice together. Nothing here about converting other people to our God. So it is, it is an extraordinary embrace of religious pluralism. So, the, I've, I've divided this into three parts. Uh, chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, describe reality. Verse 12, uh, anticipate. And then in chapter 4, uh, engage in hope. But if you take simply uh, 9 through 12 and chapter 4, 1 through 5, uh, what I want to suggest to you is that this poem, taken all together, has faith because in verses 9 through 12, which is the destruction of Jerusalem, in Christian confession, that is the crucifixion of Jesus. And verses 4, verses 1 to 5, is like the resurrection of Jesus. So the structure of the poem is that we're going to lose what we valued, and then we're going to be surprised 
in the days to come. And that space between, I reckon, uh, is Holy Saturday, in which God is deciding what to do next. And what God will do next uh, is to create a New Jerusalem, is to create a procession of economic justice, uh, is to raise Jesus from the dead. So I find in this text uh, a really uh, an amazing script for lining out faith that Jews can embrace, that Christians can embrace. And that's us some time to uh, have a conversation, and we can have a conversation, uh, as you might like, about the contemporaneity of this that I've suggested. Or if you'd like to talk about uh, how I played with the words and how to read a text or whatever you might want to talk about. Yes. Do you want to go to the microphone? No, I really don't. But okay. <laughs> I sensed that almost immediately. Uh, contemporarily, uh, we're in that struggle now. Uh, exactly what you're talking about, which may never dissolve, I don't know, but could you address that a little bit on what we're going through now as a, as a people? I think uh, in dispute when you try to make contemporaneity about it, I think we are now uh, reaping the fruits of long-term economic injustice that if you trace back far enough, you will come to slavery because uh, the great wealth of the United States has been grounded in cheap labor. And uh, what we are now facing is that it isn't sustainable anymore. It brings huge trouble among us so that I don't have any problem seeing how incredibly contemporary that this is. And if you look at verse 12, what we are watching is the failure and the dismantling of the institutions in which we have long trusted. And one of the one of the little footnotes to that is quite clearly if the church doesn't get with its proper business, the church is just going to fade away because uh, younger people are not going to fool with a church that doesn't get at the real issues. Uh, I don't I don't think that the that the threat to the institutional church is a main problem, it's a, it's a side problem, but it's a problem that concerns people like us. Uh, that, that old institutions that have been unresponsive to in the long run turn out to be unsustainable. And I think in, in very different ways that both Trump and Sanders are giving expression to that kind of restlessness in which very many people are saying, no more business as usual, because it hasn't worked. Well, only that I was just reflecting on what the Pope just did to bring refugees to, the, to Italy. And that's sort of the kind of thing. That's right. That's right. I think even the, even the Pope's uh, encyclical that I haven't read, I've only read about, about uh, extending graciousness to divorced people and all that, I, I think that is another move to break up this system of certitude that has just excluded very many people. The, the whole, the, this whole system that he describes is designed to keep many people out of the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I think. Yep, yep. Yes? Would it be a fair description of what's happening to say that the turmoil we're involved in now <coughs> is an adaptation by the society to the problem <coughs> of society and a church that does not adapt as the church did during the Reformation and the society has done with the, uh, the end of the absolute right of kings 
century and the word is that the missionaries went out to do good and they did very well. <laughs> they, they all ended up with pineapple farms. <laughs> yes, please. Extremely hopeful is under three. Uh, each of our traits and strong nations for the world. And then somehow we tore up Deuteronomy. Nation shall not lift up the sword against nation, but and then finally, and none shall make them afraid. Yeah. Now, I, you begin on that point. You can you talk a little bit about that. How do we assure that this uh, knowledge, that this instruction, can accomplish the international task? Well, it's a it's a theological conviction that is not easily translated into political reality. But, but I think the conviction will be at the political work. And I think that the political work uh, is to uh, minimize the dominating influence of the power structure in Jerusalem so that subsistence farmers in Micah's village have a voice in money policy and banking policy and military policy because if those subsistence farmers have a voice in those policies, you get very different policies. That's what I think. Thank you. There is a, there is a book by James Risen who is a, a columnist for the New York Times, and uh, I can't remember the title of the book, but the argument of the book is that the money classes, the money classes are prepared. The nation is not at war, only the army is at war. Don't bother me. So we can perpetuate the war 
as long as we can find other people's children who are prepared to do it for us. And uh, this poetry intends to break that cycle. W. H. Auden said, "Poetry doesn't do anything, but the Bible bets a great deal on poetry." Yes, please. You, you talked about this earlier being poetry, and perhaps then somewhat disconnected from what the reality was at the time. But then you connected it to contemporary life for us here. I don't know that we believe in it, but there is the doctrine of countervailing power. And is there a countervailing power argued either in the scripture or in reality today that is going to change this? Well, this poetic tradition argues that, that the countervailing power is the purpose of God. Right. That is a question that God's countervailing power will prevail. So we don't know how. So we can look forward with optimism. We can look forward with optimism, and we can get to work with it on it with optimism. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. We are a young country. Our country was based and founded on three things. Love of God, love of our family, and today we've gone away from that yep. dramatically. And We've had the experience, my wife and I, traveling throughout the world, including Israel. And you know, there's an old saying that time changes everything. <coughs> and it has. We live in a better life, we have better clothes, we have better fed, medical, much better. But there's still evil throughout the world. And there's politics that is not clean anymore. It used to be that we looked up to a politician. Today, we look at a politician with a lot of questions. And it's unfortunate. Even our church is under fire. It's difficult today to stand up and say, I'm a Christian. I go to St. Mary's Church. I do that. I'm proud to do that. But it's becoming more and more difficult. I, I think you're right about the love of God and love of neighbor, but the third thing that our country was founded on was slavery, north and south. It's written in the Constitution. These people are three fifths people. It's in the Constitution. That was a founding conviction that was written in the Constitution. Yes, but today the answer to a lot of our problems is education. That's right. And if we don't do something about that, we don't need to. That's, that's correct. So we have to think about uh, the refusal of money people from the support of public schools. And we're, we're very close to arriving and public schools that are simply for the left behind uh, so that we have a supply of cheap labor. instruction that's Torah, uh, that if that is the book of Deuteronomy, and you know that's not certain, I, I think that's likely, but if it is the book of Deuteronomy, uh, uh, what that means is you study the book of Deuteronomy, which is filled with specifics about economic justice, and then you set about implementing them. That's political action. So that, that the study of the Torah is not simply a religious idea, 
It is an act of imagination that propels us into public action. And, and uh, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is filled with radical uh, political vision, the most radical of which is the provision for what is called the year of release, that at the end of seven years, you got to cancel debts on poor people. Well, my, my, experience, my experience with that is whenever I mention that, somebody invariably raises their hand and says, there isn't any evidence that they ever really did that. Is there? Well, I think this book is filled with things that haven't been tried yet. <laughs> but we are alert to how dangerous that is. Because if the debt structure gets called into question, present power arrangements are immediately placed in jeopardy. So when you read, when you get instruction from the Torah, the, 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 then the practical question is, how far do you want to go with that? And most of us say, not so far. <laughs> but it's very political. Yeah. One thing I'd say about Deuteronomy also is that it is very clear about treating the alien in the same way that the resident Jew is treated. That's right. That aliens have the same protection of the Torah law. They are not the other. That's right. They, they don't get the pass on, but beyond that, they're, they're talking to the That's right. In, in, the, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, is the only law in the Old Testament concerning the king. And what it says about the king is he shall not collect horses and chariots, which means weapons. He shall not collect wives, and he shall not collect silver and gold. So what's the point of being a king? <laughs> <laughs> and then Moses goes on to say, instead of all that, what he shall do is to read the Torah day and night. So read the book of Deuteronomy, then keep reminding him about what his economic responsibilities are. So, yes? When Jesus, first announced, when Jesus first announces his ministry, he refers to Jubilee. That's correct. And, and in, the, in the Matthew and Luke 4, when he faces the devil and temptations, he quotes his resistance to the devil is three times to quote the book of Deuteronomy. He knew. <laughs> I think we're supposed to stop, right? Okay. Uh, yes. This is uh, just a question. Uh, you know, it's all, uh, everybody would like for this to work out, I think. But I think always in society, what do you do with those who can do it better? You know, I mean, that's, you know, there's some, there some people who are just better at something than somebody else. Right. And so that starts it going. Yeah. And I, they, you know, I guess you just have to teach. How do you ever solve that? I mean, you don't want them not to succeed, right? And you won't prevent it either. I I think uh, the analog is uh, what you do in a family if you got four kids, and one of them mostly doesn't get it. <laughs> My impression is every family has somebody. <laughs> I don't know if it's you, but he's still a member of the family who is cared for. I understand that's not easily applicable to public question, but it is the truth. They're not members of the family, but they're neighbors. So provision must be made to utilize the gifts that that person has that may be modest gifts. 
I've been getting educated in asset-based community, which is the theory that every community has adequate assets if you can mobilize them. So th then the question is, how do you mobilize them? So I assume we're all in agreement. <laughs> <laughs>